Hey guys, and welcome to Go Build a TV. Um, this episode was filmed on November 13th, 2020, and today we're going to do a new kind of stream for us at least, which is um, builds. Um, we're going to build and put together a belt driven Mechanum chassis that is based around our new Mechanum wheels and um, low side U channel. So, this is a chassis that I've seen a lot of teams put together independently. Um, on CAD, over on Discord and Reddit, and it's a really, really cool idea because it relies on low side U channel, um, be, you being able to box that, put two um, across from each other, and get a narrower overall system. Uh, this means you can make it narrow, or not, narrow enough to add some additional material on the outside of your wheel or uh, potentially run a longer crossbar. Um, so, it was. This is a chassis that I really like. It's a lot of fun. Um, we use some new parts that we came out with fairly recently to put it all together. And um, overall, it's a really simple and robust chassis that's really pretty easy to put together and build. Um, I have half of it put together right here. And we just need to build the other half and put together the crossbars and things like that um, on stream here. So. Um, this chassis is based on 17 hole low side U channels. These are um, 432 mil long, and you'll end up mounting them opposing and with a 27 millimeter quad lock. That's the 120271, this guy right here. And that gets you an overall OD of 20, or excuse me, of 32 millimeters. So, that distance is important because these holes right here on the go build a pattern they are um m4 or four mil holes and they are important to keep on pattern because if you have say a 16 mil standoff the distance between these two holes um say this hole and this hole aren't going to be on go build a pattern and it's going to be really tough to say take this quad block and bolt it to that system. So there are three kind of primary different so, uh, lengths of standoffs that you can use with low side channel. Um, that's going to be 19, 27, and 43. Um, and that will get you 24, 32, and 48 mil outside to outside. The last one, of course, making it the same size as the 1120 series channel. Uh, FTC dude asks when one to one meters are going to be back in stock. Uh, I don't have a great estimate right now. Um, I think it's looking like they probably will not be in next week, um, but I'm not 100% sure on that one. Um, let's see here. Good morning from Australia. Hey, how's it going? Uh, glad you could tune in and the time worked out for you. So um, the wheels we're going to be in, we're going to end up using are the new Mechanum wheels. Um, they let us run that longer crossbar and are going to be some overall kind of high, the higher performance option compared to the old ones. Um, I actually had these on another build, so I'm going to flip this hyper hub around. Um, we use the hyper hubs on the, um, sh the deep side of the wheel, so it's recessed almost all the way in the wheel in order to um, make it so we can get that chassis as narrow as possible. Um, we're still using 10 hole crossbars on this build. We could use a longer one potentially. Um, if you either boxed this channel to be 19 mil or using 19 mil standoffs instead of 27s, um, or if you saved a little bit of space somewhere else, uh, you could use 11 hole channel crossbars, which are nice. Um, the biggest advantage to an even number of hole crossbar is that uh, you get a definite center point. Um, you have a hole on channel right at the center point of your project. That can be helpful in a lot of robots where you want something dead center uh, or rotating a rotating component in the dead center of your robot. Uh, it's helpful sometimes, but not all the time. Uh, Glitches says you should announce when your stream is going to start on your Instagram. Uh, for sure. Good to know. We will do that in the future. Let's see here. Uh, Twitch notifications are a great one if you give us a follow. Um, you can tune in and starting next week, uh, for, unfortunately our, our YouTube system um, didn't quite work out today. Uh, you can actually see no one's watching us on YouTube because we're not live on YouTube today. But uh, next week we'll be live on YouTube and um, potentially another service as well. 
So if you subscribe to us on YouTube, that's a great way to get notified when we go live as well. Uh, let's see here. FTC dude says I have that screwdriver. This is the Wera Hex Plus uh, standard kind of non socket end, um, and I really like it. It's I've used it almost exclusively for a few months now, just to give it a go, um, and I've really really liked it. It does have a really positive feel when you grab onto a screw. The ratio we're going with today is 19.2 to 1, 312 RPM. It's it's the standard at this point, what we use on uh, on the strafer, on the B-line, all that stuff. Um, let's see. I'm bad at judging the center of, of 17 hole channels, so I just like to pick them up by a hole, guess what the I believe the center is, and go with it. Um, but generally, when I'm putting together a chassis, the first step for me is going to be the motors. Um, they are the motion component that everything is kind of based around, and they provide kind of a nice stand. And here I'm using 9 mil screws. This whole build actually only uses, um, I'm only going to use four lengths of screws, um, and you can get by with less. But I'm using, I believe there are 16s in the Mechanums. I'm also using 9s, 8s, and 11s. Uh, these I'm using 9s. You could use 8s, you could use 11s, you could use 10s. Uh, it doesn't really matter. As long as you have enough thread depth in your motors to keep them there all season, it's pretty much fine. And you can get by with a shorter screw, especially if you use a thread locker like Loctite. Um, and these are a, this is a screw that you don't have access to very much. So I always want to make sure to get those pretty tight um, when you are tightening the motor screws. Uh, in addition, before, if you're reusing motors from last season, um, which a lot of teams do and is perfectly reasonable with yellow jackets, um, just want to make sure and like double check the gearboxes, make sure all the screws on the motor themselves are tight. Um, and that can make sure that you get um, an overall pretty nice experience from your second or third year motors um, like some teams are looking at now. Uh, FTC dude asks if we're going to do a dead axle today. Nope, it's a live axle. Um, it's a live axle cantilever setup where your belt is in tube and or belt in the drive rail and the wheel is outside. So let's see here. Um, Diamond Goddess 14 asks if we're doing a giveaway today. We are. We are doing a. Um, we're going to give away four uh, eight millimeter Rex bore Sonic hubs. I will actually get that started for you. Um, so we can jump in and start that up. Um, we figured like Sonic hubs are always something that you need around um, whenever you're working with robots, especially when you're working with 8 Rex. Um, and if you've not worked with 8 Rex yet, it's something you almost always, you almost always will want when you start to look at using 8 Rex. Let's see here. Do, 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 do. We will get that going for you real quick here. there. All right, that should be started. Um, and make sure you're following, of course, in order to win, and just type the keyword um, 8 millimeter Rex, all one word, number 8, uh, just like you can see in the chat there. So uh, let's see here. B uh, Baron asks what my favorite Loctite flavor is. I've heard red tastes pretty good. I, I've not tried any of them, but um, I know there is some um, Loctite that is specifically designed to bond shafts. I feel like that would be, it, it just is intriguing, I think. Uh, I, don't, I don't know why. Mm, dry sticker, I guess. So we've got the motors installed. That's all fine and dandy. Um, we can go ahead and actually install the motor pinion uh, pulleys. These are 16 tooth D bore pull pinion pulleys, um, and they are a very solid option here. The other option is to use a 24 tooth and um, run a Sonic hub. 
that is also a really nice option. It's a little bit bulkier uh, and it uses a few more components, but um, you actually get more pop, more drive on your belt because of the more um, teeth engaged with the belt. And it's, it is also a pretty nice system. The key factor today is that it takes longer to build. So um, a lot of this build is designed around being really quick to put together. There we go. Um, we're honestly a lot of the way done. Uh, let's see here. FTC dude says it'd be cool if you gave away channels. That's something we'll look at in the future. That would be cool. Um, we can definitely give away some U and low side U channels. Uh, any idea when those pulleys will be back in stock? I believe they're, oh man, one or two weeks away, I believe. Uh, not 100% sure on that one either. Uh, if you tag me on Discord or shoot me an email, I can get you a pretty solid ETA on those. Uh, does this work? Proceeds to type 6 millimeter D bore. Uh, if you do win and you really, really want 6 D bore pulleys, we, or Sonics, we probably could get you some, but 8-Rex uh, is kind of the way we really foresee Gilbildo going in the future, and it's, it's a really, really solid option for FTC. Um, the biggest advantage is that it works in all the 14 mil holes that you're used to, and it's kind of a beefier, bulkier shaft, and with 2106 shafting, which is the snap ring threaded end shafts like we're using today, um, it's really, really easy to put together, and it actually can save cost. Uh, one, one of the big reasons we were able to increase the functionality of the strafer chassis um, while also keeping the, the price the same was 2106 shafting. Um, that we could replace collars. In this application specifically, you would need a collar. Um, in a traditional application, you can replace that with a 2106 shaft and all of a sudden you get this um, stronger, easier to work with solution that is cheaper which is really nice. Um, do, 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 do. Something that's interesting I found, uh, Extra Battery 2 says, is that you can hammer it on the end of the shaft to expand it and retain something on like a bearing without the, necessary, without the necessity of a collar or E-clip. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, th that works, yeah. Uh, so you're talking about just expanding the end of a shaft, you add some mar, uh, it, <laughs> that would work just fine. Um, it's a not very conventional method, but if it works for you, it works for you. Let's see, can you send out some six milli round bore pulleys for me to round out again? Um, rounding out 6D stuff happens sometimes, and that's actually a big reason that we ended up going with uh, a lot of the 8 Rex components especially when you're looking at aluminum parts. Um, eight millimeter Rex can let you have a lot more material on something like an arm or another system like that. Um, we have had some customers round out 6D uh, Sonic Hubs on arms and just like really extreme workloads that eight Rex uh, would totally handle no problem. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. It's super solid if you do it deliberately. deliberately extra battery too says, uh, referring to the hammering on the end of the A-Rex shafts. Uh, it, I'm sure it works fine. Um, it definitely is one way to do it. Um, do, 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 do. Diamond Goddess 14 asks uh, why your why your batteries that fit inside a channel are illegal for FTC. Um, I'm not 100% sure on that one. Uh, we would love to know too. We reached out and talked to First about it, but. Um, they just said it, they just said no, pretty much from what I remember about that conversation. So, um, they use the same cells. They're made in the same factory as the modern robotics, um, batteries that we resell. It, they're just in a slightly different configuration and they have a nicer connector on it. But first just said that wasn't something they're interested in, unfortunately. So, um, while we were talking, I have, in, uh, installed the eight Rex war 16 tooth pulley on my driven shaft and with a, an 8-Rex bearing and I've tightened the set screws. One thing to definitely watch out for is to make sure that those pulleys are aligned fairly well. Um, I like looking down the top through these four mil holes and looking at the outside of the flange of each. 
holes in this size actually give you a really good visual um, indication of how far away something is from a wall. Um, because you can say, oh, that's like two thirds of the way through that hole on this side. And you can get really precise just by eyeballing stuff. Um, XT30 isn't that nice, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I, I know a lot of P FTC people, and I, me included, do like power poles. Um, I know power poles have kind of a mixed, um, mixed opinion in some circles. Um, XT30s are definitely a more commonly used connector outside of FTC, um, and they have a lot. They are getting a lot more popularity and kind of becoming the standard. Um, they are a little loose, and for competition robotics, they're not my favorite. Uh, XT60s are super nice from a uh, so for, because they're really solid. Um, and they tend to stay where you put them pretty well, but they are way overrated for the amount of current that you can pull out of an FTC battery. <laughs> um, solder joint and no retention. Solder's actually, yeah, okay. I understand that. Yeah, that's, those, are, those are, both, are both definitely downsides of XT, uh, XT connectors. Uh, none of them are crimp, so they're probably not gonna be amazing. Um, as far as transferring power goes, probably not as nice as a crimp, but um, still definitely fine viable options. The amount of power you would lose would be, if you are not already like buying three times more batteries than you need and testing them and binning batteries, the amount of power that you would um, gain by having a crimped connector would be way dwarfed by something like that. Uh, crimp power poles are nice. A lot of teams actually like replace the bullets on um, go build the motors with power poles and a lot of teams replace like the Tamiya on the modern robotics battery with power pole and then a power pole to XT30 adapter. That's a perfectly reasonable option. I do like that XT30s um, are indexed. You can't put an XT30 on wrong or you can't plug an XT30 in wrong. You can install it wrong. Um, but once it's installed correctly, it's harder to mess up. Um, so far I have a tensioner in here that gives you the, uh, a pretty good amount of belt tension. This is still fairly loose, um, but you're not dragging against anything and this isn't going to skip. So this is a, a really smooth system. It'll also tighten up some as I add the second bearing on this shaft. Um, so it's a pretty smooth running, uh, amount of tension, you can always increase that by just changing this idler placement. Uh, the two axes you can use to change the amount of tension you have on a belt are your X and Y. Um, changing your tensioner along the X axis doesn't seem like it would do anything, but getting closer to each pulley will actually increase your tension. The least amount of tension you can get is right between the two in the center, um, and then as you get closer you increase. Um, and of course getting further down into the belt and biting further definitely gets you more tension as well. So you do get a lot of indexability on channel because you have so many holes to work with. Um, and there are, it's really, really rare um, that you find a, a setup that you can't find the right amount of tension for. Um, it's definitely, we've tested like every combination of one to one pulleys, either 24 or 16. But if you have some ratios, especially with 3D printed pulleys, that is, um, n you can run into situations where you can't get the right amount of tension. Um, FTC dude asks what the piece that is pushing the belt is. That's our acetyl timing, or acetyl belt idler bushing. Um, I, let's see here. It is a 34, 30, 34.13.0101. Um, so that is, it just runs on a 27 mil long standoff in this case. It's got a six mil ID and it's running on a six mil OD standoff. Um, this gives it overall a pretty smooth, it runs pretty smooth because it's acetyl um, and acetyl is overall a pretty smooth running plastic. Um, Extra Battery 2 asks if we'd consider making eight mil Rex tapped, eight mil tapped aluminum Rex. It's definitely something we would look into um, uh, it, that would kind of be standoff feeling, so that would be cool. I think that would be something to take a look at. Um, GEMP asks if we'll post a parts list. Uh, a parts list is something that I will hopefully have in the YouTube description for this archive, which will be up 
sometime next week, or you can shoot me an email to tech at cobuilda.com, and I can send you a parts list. Um, aluminum 8 Rex would be very weak. It would be stronger than our existing aluminum standoffs, most likely, so in an application where you would use an existing 6 mil OD standoff, an 8 Rex standoff would be fine. Um, but yeah, definitely not as strong as something like a steel 2106 shaft that you can also use as a standoff. Um, do, 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 do. It seems like it would be a really cool part, definitely something we will take a look at and uh, talk about more in the future. Um, I'm one of the easier people in R&D to convince of an idea. Um, it's kind of why I, I get a lot of suggestions, I think, from the audience. Um, you really have to convince uh, some of the other guys here if you really want some new Go Build a Parts. So if you have an idea suggestion, definitely make sure uh, to include like your use cases and stuff like that to help me sell it. Um, let's see here. We'll install the other side of our timing belt system over here. Do, 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 do. Um, here I'm using 8 mil Rex bearings because it's a drivetrain. Uh, we've run a lot of drivetrains on 8 round um, on 8 Rex shaft and it does work just fine. Um, we've run, I, and teams have run all season last year on that setup, but um, like all of our kits now, especially we'll use 8 Rex ID bearings, they are just overall stronger and a little bit nicer to work with, I think. Let's see here. Mm. Diamond Goddess 14 asks the, my opinion on plastic chain. Um, I like plastic chain a lot, especially for tensioning stuff. Um, it is, excuse me, I was thinking about belt tension. I like plastic chain a lot for prototyping because you can adjust the amount of chain you have really quickly. Um, it is really easy to throw together and kind of make a really quick and dirty prototype that does what you're looking for. So that's my favorite use case for it. It's not my overall favorite for a drivetrain or a competition robot, um, but you can make really quick prototypes with it, which is a big advantage. Do, 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 do. Uh, what's the advantage of live axle you're building, of the live axle that you're building versus the standard strafer kit? Um, they both kind of have ups and downs. Um, let's see here. The, I suppose the biggest advantage of the strafer over a setup like this is that on a strafer, you don't have any motors in the center section of your robot. Here is the half of the strife train that I built a little earlier and the part that we're working on right now. Um, a strafer has nothing in the center space that's currently occupied by the motors. That's the biggest advantage of the strafer. Um, the biggest advantage of this is that you can make the drive pods thinner. Uh, you could make these 24 wide if you wanted to and potentially sacrifice a little bit of down the road usability. Um, but that's a good option if you need a longer crossbar if you're, or if you need to mount something on the outside of your wheels there. It's a good option for teams who are also hoping to roll a little bit more of their own solution out of Guild Build Aparts. My name is unavailable. Um, that's funny. What are the main advantages of doing dead axle over live axle or vice versa? Uh, I think in modern FTC, um, it's not as much of a difference. It's not as polarized. Um, if you were looking at FTC five years ago when I started and hubs weren't particularly reliable, uh, dead axle starts to make a lot more sense because um, you're looking at a system that a set screw backing out won't cause a failure of your drivetrain. With um, profile hubs, uh, like a 6 mil D bore hub or an 8-rex bore hub, um, and things like profile bore um, sprockets and pulleys, it's just not as much of a concern because even in the event that your set screw does back out, um, there are six set screws on each uh, side of this drivetrain that could potentially back out. Um, the, even if that does back out, you still have a positive drive where that pulley is interfacing with the shaft. So chances are your drivetrain will still work. It may not work as well, but um, it will still function and means you have the potential to continue scoring points in that match. Um, so it makes the, the difference 
between live axle and dead axle a lot less noticeable um, because there is not a big reliability difference between the two. Um, the biggest advantage of a dead axle system, um, a dead axle system, excuse me, is where you have bearings in the wheel's core and you have a, some kind of power transmission mechanism, say a um, belt and pulley system or a ch spr ch whew, sprocket and chain system that's also bolted to the wheel. In this case, there are bearings on this wheel, so this shaft is dead, it's not spinning at all, and there is a pulley here, so I can drive this wheel directly mounted. There's n nothing, there's very, very little that can go wrong in this setup, uh, and it's very, very reliable, which is a big advantage. Um, and if you are doing a parallel plate setup where you have a plate on either side of your wheel, this can be really, really, comp uh, really, really compact. But um, I don't think there's a big reliability difference between dead and live axle anymore. So I like live axle if you're doing cantilever because it means your power transmission device can be inside of your frame rail. Um, and I like dead axle if you're doing parallel plate because you can make it a little more compact. And it means your, your dr what would normally be your driven shaft all of a sudden can act like a standoff uh, if you anchor it on either side with a hub or with screws. Let's see here. Um, FTC dude says y'all's eight millimeter Rex hyper hub step file is wrong. Uh, I will definitely look at that as soon as we are done streaming today. Right now I have a 1201432. The quad block pattern mount as you guys know it, I'm sure. I am bolting this on this chassis before I put the other side of this cross, or the other 1121U channel on. Um, because it's gonna be hard, I actually don't have those on this side, so we'll actually have to take that back apart, add the quad blocks, and then put it back together. But I think that's a good example of how maintainable this, a chassis in this style is. Um, a big part of GoBuilda is taking stuff apart and putting it back together. Um, most of the time when I am prototyping out a, dry, a kit or um, something like a straight forward the beeline and I'm in the later stages of that prototyping where I'm building it in real life, I end up taking stuff apart and putting it back together so many times. Um, and that's just part of GoBuilda. Uh, it, part of working with GoBuilda is building something, seeing how it works, seeing how it works with stuff in the real life and then taking it apart, making changes and putting it back together. So you may have, um, I worked with Recharge Screen a lot in Skystone, and you may have times where your robot is almost gone um, compared to the last competition, where it was totally torn apart in pieces, um, and then after you've learned all the things that you want to learn and ch made all the changes you need to, put it back together and with all those changes. Let's see here. The... Uh, Yes, Ultraviolet FTC says for the, uh, yes, okay, I see. Um, yeah, six mil standoffs on a drivetrain. I'm um, just kind of catching up with the chat there. R are perfectly fine if you have a lot of them. Um, we'll add our other 27 mil quad block here. They can be super solid options. Um, but you definitely need more of them than you would um, a larger standoff with a larger size screw. Uh, something like an M6 would be, you could definitely get by with fewer standoffs or something like a 2106 shaft where you have a larger, um, the screw size isn't always the point of failure in a standoff or the point that makes it less rigid. The cross-sectional area of your standoff will actually also increase the rigidity of the system as a whole because the larger that cross-sectional area, the more stable it is. It's the same reason this is a lot harder to get stand up than this. Um, you basically have that same system on a much smaller scale on the standoff. Uh, why would you use Rex when there is Ethan? I'm lost on that one, but uh, okay. Uh, okay, I'm sold Nick Aluminum 8mm Rex. <laughs> um, that'd be cool. I think that'd be a sweet option. 
for another standoff. The downside is it's a whole nother standoff. So there are a lot of additional parts um, in that system overall. So we've got our other side of our crossbar on, and this is actually kind of starting to look like a drive rail all of a sudden. If I hadn't built this one earlier, it would be uh, a little more fun, I feel like, seeing this come together. But um, since I did already, we can still enjoy this moment. Um, the screw choices in each system are, um, let's see here. Yeah, that's a good question. OK. Messed up on that one. I accidentally used nine mil screws in my quad blocks in the face, which means the threads don't work since those are too long. Classic rookie mistake. I even grabbed eight mil screws. Um, so quad blocks, um, you generally are going to use 11 mil screws going into the sides and eight mil long screws going into the face. Um, as long as you're hoping to mount on the 32 pattern, which is the larger pattern on that quad block. That is the strongest option, which is really nice. Uh, Lego Cam says, are there any go build a parts that you have developed but not released for some reason? Um, whew. They're definitely, I think it depends on your definition of developed. Um, we have developed a lot of parts. Um, and the degree to which we have developed them changes a lot. Uh, some ideas don't make it past like a five minute or one second idea um, in a brainstorming phase. And some ideas we kick around for years before um, we decide that they are finally not going to be a part that we release. Um, we definitely have gotten some parts um, that have been fairly late stage that we've decided not to go ahead and go with. But that's fairly rare. Um, and exact reasonings for those depend entirely on the part. So I'm actually going ahead and replacing all of those 9 mil screws that I um, used on accident with 8 mil screws. So that means the threads will work when I throw an 11 mil screw into the standoff or into this 1201 later on. Uh. And I like replacing screws in a clockwise direction because otherwise I'll forget how many I've done and all that stuff. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Andrew said he basically said no leak. Um, that's honest. That's a lot of my job um, is you guys will ask something. Um, I think that somebody sent me an email I, the day before we released new mechanics asking for countersunk mechanics, and that was funny because it's like I can't say and like even though they're going to be released tomorrow I can't tell you that we're going to release them tomorrow um, so we had to just be like oh thanks for your suggestion and that's what I do a lot of the time um, sometimes there are parts that we talk about on Google the TV or on discord that are definitely on their way um, but we can't talk about it yet, so that is fun. Um, Gemp asks, what are a sign that the motor is not worth using? Uh, if it's making any particularly odd noises, uh, there may be something wrong with it. Um, if it's pulling a lot of current, um, which you can check like using the RevHub uh, interface on your computer, or you can pull using uh, code somehow if you're a fancy magic code person. Um, if it is pulling uh, an unreasonable amount of current compared to the rest of your motors in the same application, um, that's a, a, normally a bad sign. Or if it's not pulling very much current at all, or being abnormal, if it's just not normal. Uh, if it's loud, slow, fast, um, stuff like that. Uh, Technova69 asks if there's a reason you can't talk about upcoming par parts. Um, <laughs> Some of it is that uh, if we talk about a part, there's definitely an expectation of when it's going to be here. And um, sometimes we're not 100% sure when a part is going to be um, ready for the prime time uh, from a design perspective or a manufacturing perspective. So um, something like a great example is the A-Rex miter gears that we talked about on the first updates now uh, in February a couple years ago. And they took a while to get ready because we wanted to bake in all the functionality we could 
and try out a ton of ideas um, and make sure those were the best possible. But we were answering questions about those and people were counting on them in designs for a long time before um, they ended up actually being released, which is really not the, um, not the interaction we want with Go Build a Stuff. So I'll replace all these nine mil screws that I used incorrectly. Um, red D underscore D2 says, um, don't want to leak before patents. Some things we do have um, IP on and want to get IP on before we release them. That is also something to keep in mind. There are always a lot of factors behind any decisions like that. And um, I definitely am not involved in all those conversations too. So sometimes it's just, uh, hey, that's not something you can talk about. But I always want to talk about all the stuff when it's coming and want to be really excited about stuff. So that's always tough to be like, ah, uh, <laughs> we want to release this right as people can buy it and make a big splash where you can actually go and spend money uh, and get the part in your hand pretty soon as opposed to making you wait for a while before. Let's see here. Miters are less efficient than belts is. Okay, let's see here. Uh, that's probably right. Um, it depends a lot on the pitch of the belt, the pitch of the gear, and a lot of that stuff. But I would say your chances of getting a really smooth belt setup with GoBuilda is probably a little higher than your chances of getting a really smooth miter setup with GoBuilda, just because it's um, it's going to be a little more plug and play and a little easier to work with overall. Uh, Dan's van says, LOL, I was actually about to recommend that you all make a landing page for GoBuilda TV to say Twitch or YouTube. Um, I think we, yeah, we do have one now. So um, you should be able to jump in. Definitely next week when we have YouTube up and all of that stuff, um, you'll be able to jump in and watch it there. So we have um, a lot of this together. I'll add a couple more screws in the far side of the standoffs that I'm using for my idlers. And we will be pretty close to having this thing kind of running around. Um, Glitch has asked if, I, if we thought about a work surface mat. That would be cool. That's not something we've really looked at a whole lot. Um, maybe a new merch item that we could take a look at. Um, let's see. Uh, Glitches is right. We used automotive paint on that mechanum wheel. Thanks for jumping on that question. I must have missed it. Um, that's, it's a nice kind of weatherproof paint, but any paint that is designed to stick to steel is a pretty good option. And now we are pretty much ready to go ahead and put our wheel on. Um, we need about three mil of space to clear the screws on these 1201s. So I'm going to use three, three, three one mil shims. Um, you could also use one four mil spacer. That'd be a great option too. Um, this is what I had around and it's, it's technically more compact. Uh, and something I honestly miss sometimes even is to make sure that the, um, your whole setup, setup is really sandwiched together and really solid. And I'll show you in a second, but you can definitely see that there's not very much clearance past the mechanisms and those screws. It's honestly a pretty tight system overall. You can see there, basic, between these screws here and this mechanum wheel, it's pretty smooth. And you can, you might be able to hear it, um, probably not. But, oh, it's the shims. Um, but it's really smooth and you get a really direct feel. You get some backlash, most of that is actually just in the motor shaft. Um, but it is really a nice amount of backlash in that system and it's really, really easy to get something that's very smooth. Um, let's see here. Actually, um, one thing that I do a lot of the time when I'm designing a chassis and I, I'm a little embarrassed about it is that I, I make things reversible really easy so that I don't have to make another assembly of them in on shape. So that this is exactly the same besides the wheel orientation as this. Um, which is why I didn't check to make sure I was putting the right wheel on because I can just flip the whole drive rail over and it's the same. Um, that does mean that the motors are in the center of the chassis and all that stuff. So there are for sure designs where that makes a lot less sense. But here 
that is kind of nice as long as you know you have different wheels on your uh, right side and different wheels on your left side you are pretty much good to go and we're pretty close um, I don't have the 1201s on this side that I assembled earlier so I'm actually going to tear that back apart add the 1201s and we'll add the standoffs and put it all together Work service mat would be cool. I like that idea a lot. Uh, I have a, a Savox servo one at my desk and I like it. I've never actually referred to it. Um, it. It tells you like all the specs of all the Savox servos they sell. And I've like, I've never looked at it with the intent of seeing what shopping for a servo, but it looks cool. Uh, let's see here. Go build a t cable ties. We do have cable ties. Um, they fit through the, well, a big reason we chose the exact cable ties we have is they fit through four mil holes. So you can tie stuff to go build it really easily. Uh, one thing I, I tried to use some uh, when I was in FTC that did not interface with go build it very well. And it's definitely a lot yet less usable. Mouse pad would be sweet though. I think it'd be, it's pretty similar to a work surface. Uh, most people, here at least definitely do a lot of hands-on work on, at their desks so uh, it seems like the overlap there would be pretty um, pretty large uh, what happened to the go build a cable management clips i'm honestly not sure what you're referring to there it may be something that i just don't remember um, but that's a great question i can definitely check on that if you tag me on discord shoot me an email or something like that uh, with like a, some more specifics or a picture. I can check with somebody who's been here a little longer and see uh, if that's something. So we've got those four or six screws out that hold the chassis together and we can just pop this channel off. Boom. I'm just gonna leave the bearings in it because it's pretty easy. And we will go ahead and make sure we use 8mm screws this time and add the other two 1201s. Definitely want to make sure that I'm adding them in the same place because I really don't want to take this chassis apart again. Um, but realistically, it's not too bad to put together or take apart. Uh, we've been streaming for uh, 45 minutes, 40 minutes around, somewhere around there. Uh, and we have half of that chassis together. so. It's really not a whole lot of work to put one of these together if you have all the parts you need and you are working off CAD or something like that. Extra value 2 says, is there anything else I can do to help pitch 8mm aluminum wrecks to the Go Build a Team? Um, if you have any use cases you particularly want outside of standoffs or anything, um, that's always fun to hear. Let's see here. Uh, not braided cable ties. Uh, okay. Doo -doo -doo -doo. One thing I do wonder is how do you guys do cable management across your robot? Are you like the corrugated tube or just zip ties and wire? Uh, I know we used a lot of um, of that like corrugated, I, it's, I don't think it's hose, but it's kind of a tube thing that you can run wires through has a slit down one, um, but I've seen a lot of really, really clean robots and I, I'm not sure what most teams do. Um, let's see, FTC dude asks who's won, no one's won yet. Uh, we'll roll for our giveaway in a few minutes here. I'll finish, I'll put this side of the chassis back together and we will roll for our giveaway. Uh, so if you do want to make sure you're giving us a or you've given us a follow and you've typed the keyword 8mm Rex in the chat, and uh, for your chance to win four of those Sonic Cubs. Uh, zip ties and spiral ties are, uh, sounds right, yeah. Uh, stuff in channel, yeah. That definitely makes sense. Um, channel is a good way to protect wires overall. A little bit of everything is also really reasonable. Uh, I went and rewired the Robot in Three Days robot fairly recently for, um, we showed it off, and robot, wiring a robot is not as much fun as I remember. I remember enjoying it, um, and I, I don't, I did not enjoy it as much last time I did it. Let's see, Ultraviolet FTC, uh, we're mounting our 
electronics upside down underneath the robot. All the wires run through channels with rubber, gr rubber grommets down there. Uh, keeps them hidden yet accessible. I do like that a lot. Um, where it's, you, you don't see the underside of robots almost ever, but um, that gives you access to it. You can just flip the robot over. That's nice. Uh, let's see. Some uh, Chief with Beef says some Velcro cable ties would be excellent and I don't have to cut a ton of zip ties when I rewire my robot. Definitely makes sense. Uh, that's something we can definitely take a look at. Might be a little more expensive, but I suppose if they were usable, it's no big deal. So we've got that all set up. We've got our bearings back in place and we can pretty much just put these back screw six screws back in place to lock that. Um, because you're using 1201s on the ends, this whole setup is pretty rigid. I do think you need at least two standoffs kind of toward the center um, to keep it fairly rigid. And since you're buying a pack of four, you might just pick up two four packs if you're going to build a chassis like this and add two more near the center. Uh, then you have kind of an overall nice system there. Uh, let's see here. I leave it till the last second and don't plan at all wire management. I, yes, I definitely have done that a lot on robots. Uh, I don't mind paying the extra to be lazy and reduce plastic waste. So that's a good, good way to look at it. I like that. Uh, who be the winner? Awesome dude, 6400 6, asks. Uh, let me put these wheels on this chassis and we'll find out quick. Uh, spam bots in the chat. Thanks. We will definitely get those deleted pretty quick. Uh, reinstall our shims here. And tighten up those pinch bolts. Um, pinch bolts are something you can get back at and retighten pretty, pretty frequently on most robots, so it's not the biggest deal. Um, so I like to check them before competitions and make sure that is um, something that we can always keep an eye on. I think those should be, let's see here. All right, so we will roll for our giveaway, uh, close those entries, um, and pick our winner. Uh, it looks like Diamond Goddess 14 uh, on those Sonic hubs. That is wild. Um, I guess you rigged our system somehow on two weeks in a row. So I wouldn't stop watching if I were you. You were on a streak. Um, let's see here. So congrats. Shoot us an email to marketing at gobuilded.com and um, claim your free hubs. Um, let us know if you would prefer 8 Rex um, to 60. If you really want 60, we probably could do that for you. Let's see here. This would be way easier with a ball end hex key. Can you grab me one, Josh? Thank you. Yeah. Um, or just a really long one. I can't really reach those from with my plain end. I really love the plain end hex key for... Um, the amount of positive drive that you get. Man, that reminds me of dropping a guitar pick into a, an acoustic guitar. Um, I like them a lot from a usability standpoint, but you can get more places with a ball and hex key. So most of the time I have both. Um, and overall, it gives you the flexibility you would get normally with um, a system like that. And also, um, with a plain end, you can get that really nice drive. With smaller drivers, uh, a plain end is more vital. Uh, with a three mil, you can get by with a ball end almost all the time. Um, and it's just when you have to really tighten down on a screw that a plain end is really, really nice. Hmm. I suppose we could have done this first uh, and, and added our um, crossbars, but this is really not too bad. And a lot of times crossbars are more design specific anyway. So that is really reasonable. Uh, 101 Bob 101 asks, will Gobilda ever sell Eclipse individually? Um, that is something we are looking at. Um, that would make a lot of sense to me, I think. So definitely no promises, but that's something we've been um, talking about here. Do, 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 do. 
Uh, definitely rigged, I would say. Um, she did win last time, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, conveyor belts aren't timing because of tracking issues. Um, that would make sense. Uh, we used round belt for our conveyor. I'm not really sure how well, I mean, your standard HTD timing belt would interface with the rings, but I've seen a couple teams work on doing that system, and they haven't said it didn't hasn't worked so far, so it seems like that's a promising system, probably pretty easy to use. Oh, um, I, I see, yeah. There's, um, let's see, Red D2's point was that there's no... Uh, tracking on the timing belts to kind of keep them in place. So that definitely makes sense. Uh, unless you are running a ton of timing belts, which would work fine, and then you just have your, your flanges on the pulleys. Here we... Oh no, I suppose we can just flip the half of that drive frame. I was going to say we need to make sure we put our wheels on right, which we do, but um, we want to make sure that we do that all correctly when we are ready to put the two halves of our drivetrain together. I'd say we cut pretty close on time. It's almost time to, to head home for the weekend. So this is kind of a fun format. I do like building a lot. Um, and it means I have this kind of fun belt driven chassis to, to play around with. It'd be nice to get this all wired up and running. Um, hmm. That is backwards. Yep, so here I've got, you guys are looking at the bottom of the chassis. Um, I'm not sure how, t how well you can see on camera, but here you've got um, kind of an O shape formed out of the rollers. Um, since you're looking at the bottom, that's correct. This would be the top and you've got your X shape. Um, formed by the rollers. That de gives you the most um, direct connection between your motors to the ground. Um, you actually transfer, to my understanding, all the same amount of forces to the ground through your wheels in the wrong orientation. The biggest downside is that your rotation isn't, any long isn't controlled any longer. I'll show you in just a second when I get this the bare minimum amount of screws to hold this chassis together. Um, in the correct orientation, yes, that's right. Um, you To rotate your robot, you need to spin the wheels, um, so which means your motors are spinning, which means if your motors are holding their position, it's a lot harder to come around and knock your robot off course. If you are running in the wrong orientation, your rollers are in um, an O shape from the top, and for your robot to rotate, the only thing that needs to rotate is the rollers. So all of a sudden, if I am trying to turn the robot, I don't have very much control, and if something hits me, or if I'm just strafing along, that's no longer under motor power. So um, that's why it's really important to have that orientation correct, because otherwise you lose out on the controllability of your chassis. Um, Extra Battery 2 asks uh, if there's any reason uh, we didn't use low side for the cross members. Um, not in particular. Uh, full channel gives you more um, holes to use to mount stuff to. That's a big thing. Um, and it's a better bang for your buck in terms of strength per dollar, I guess, uh, if you looked at it that way. Uh, low side U channel, unfortunately, two lengths of low side U-channel is going to be more expensive than one length of full U-channel. So uh, full U-channel here saves us a little money and, uh, or saves you guys a little money, I suppose, on this chassis and means you get a pretty similar amount of strength out of it. It also means you can use kind of standard quad blocks and all that stuff, which is uh, the nicest way, I think, to hold a chassis like this together. Uh, what's the overall the final overall width. Um, uh, let's see. That I'm not 100% sure on. I would have to double check in CAD. I do not remember. Um, I know it's less than 18 because this is going to be narrower than the strafer, but it's probably not going to be a super even number, unfortunately. Um, give the cameraman a raise. Yeah, I agree. 
Oh, there we go. Last two screws. I knew I was missing two somewhere. Uh, let's see here. I also agree. Kevin is epic. Thanks in the chat for answering some questions and double checking on step files and all that stuff. And I think this is the last screw in this chassis. Overall, um, it goes together pretty easy. We ended up at like 50 minutes. Um, with the other half of this chassis, it's about an hour and a half um, with answering questions and talking to you guys and all that stuff. So a very reasonable assembly time um, and a pretty nice chassis, I think, at least. It is um, pretty lightweight. I think it's actually gonna be lighter than the Strafer. So I'd say sub 10 pounds. I've not actually weighed it. And it's really, really smooth and low, low drag. It's crazy coming from chain, feeling a belt driven chassis and just how smooth it is. Uh, Gemp asks if you can shift motor location forward or backwards. Definitely. Uh, you just need different length belts. Uh, and that's really about it. We have a calculator on our website um, where you can check out the overall, um, the two holes you want your motor and your, your wheel to be in, the distance between those, and then figure out the, the next longest length belts to get. Most of the time you need an idler, um, but I'd say if you're pretty close. Uh, what would you, how much does it cost to build that chassis? I'm not sure. Um, I would bet, I'd bet a cheeseburger it's more than a strafer chassis, um, but I don't think it would be very much more than a strafer chassis. And I think that's pretty much all we've got for you guys today. Um, definitely tune in next week. Uh, next week, as we mentioned, will be over on YouTube as well. Um, and we are going to have another fun show for you on GoBuild.TV. Thank you guys for tuning in, and we'll talk to you later.